Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. My name is Norm Peckham, and I have with me Dr. Ariel Roth, scientist, educator, author. We're so fortunate to have him with us. We're going to start a, a two-part discussion of eyes. Small eyes, simple eyes, large eyes, complex eyes. Uh, complex eyes on simple creatures and simple eyes on complex creatures. Doctor, where do we start on this big topic? Well, uh, this is a topic that Charles Darwin was very much concerned about. <clears throat> and when he wrote his famous book, The Origin of Species, uh, he, in a section entitled Organs of Extreme Perfection and Complication, he addressed this question of the eye because this had been a question before he wrote his book, how could the eye just evolve yeah. by itself? It's been something that has been uh, a problem for evolution long before Darwin. And uh, in his Origin of Species, uh, we have here a, a statement uh, that he made. He says, to suppose that the eye with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration could have been formed by natural selection seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. Well, he wrote about evolution. He must not have just left it at that. No, he didn't. <laughs> he was trying to promote natural selection, yes. and his solution was natural selection. So a little later in the book, he, uh, he makes this statement uh, about how natural selection might do this. It's just a few pages beyond his discussion of the eye. He says, further, we must suppose that there is power represented by natural selection. This is the his idea of how evolution proceeded and how advanced organisms developed from simple ones and so on. Or the survival of the fittest, which is the idea he was promoting. Let this process go on for millions of years and during each year on millions of individuals of many kinds. And may we not believe that a living optical instrument might thus be formed. So his solution is natural selection. Okay. Other evolutionists since then have taken up the same ID, suggesting, hey, uh, th these various kind of eyes have survival values, and uh, simple ones have survival value, advanced ones have survival values, and since uh, natural selection depends on survival, uh, this provides a f or facilitates, you might say, at least a, a concept of advancement by evolution. And uh, a couple of authorities on this, uh, uh, Gaylord Simpson, famous evolutionist at Harvard University, he argues that Darwin does, as Darwin does, that since all eyes from simple to complex are functional, they all have survival value. And survival value implies evolution. Richard Dawkins, Oxford University, much more recently, he suggests all eyes are useful and provide survival value. And since we have simple eyes and complex eyes and so on, uh, it suggests you might uh, proceed from simple to complex by the process of evolution. And uh, Fuchiyama, uh, he proposes that various eyes have survival value and advanced features like the lens would evolve starting a, from a vitreous mass and so on. The question how the lens form has always been a big problem in this. So then does survival value equate to, to progressive evolution? Uh, not at all. <laughs> Keep in mind, uh, organisms would survive whether they were created or whether they evolved. And survival you know, can just mean that you're not dead. Uh, it does not imply, have to imply evolution, and we need to keep this in mind. But it is the mechanism whereby Darwin proposed advancement could take place because those organisms that were superior would survive over those that were not. We're going to look at a variety of eyes here, and uh, just to give you a, a, a little view of what 
different kind of things we find out there as we look at uh, different animals and so on. Uh, first, we've got what we call simple eyes. They're probably not eyes because they don't make a picture. They, they just detect light. They, like a light meter instead they, of a camera. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, they, uh, uh, but they're useful because you, you, and you probably can tell dim or bright light and so on. Uh, but you don't get a picture out of it like our eyes provide them. Uh, and, uh, on the left here, we've got a, a protozoan, the arrow pointing there to a, a lens and an eye. In the middle, earthworm. They have kind of a light-sensitive cells there, and uh, the arrow points to part of their skin there. And a lot more of these at the ends of the earthworm than at the, in the middle part. And, uh, a flatworm. Uh, it has kind of a round object there that, that uh, uh, also detects lights. And when you get to snails, uh, you have all kinds of eyes, uh, supposedly, uh, possibly suggesting an evolutionary sequence there. But uh, this is not the way advanced eyes develop. Advanced eyes develop from the brain, not from the skin, as uh, you'd suggest from a sequence like this. All evolutionists refer to this. It, uh, it has certain, certain problems in connection with, with their model. The uh, really eye that we're used to, to is our own, which is called sometimes the, the simple eye, but it's really the normal eye. And it's a little bit like a camera. Uh, and you, you have the blue lens there in the picture, straighten that, and uh, on the left side is the retina, and uh, that lens focuses light onto, onto the retina, and uh, you get a picture. This is an entirely different thing than just detecting light. This is making, telling you what's out there because you see, you see the various details. And, uh, uh, but you have to have very precise optics for that to work, otherwise you can get a blurred image. And uh, this picture tells you a little bit about the, the need for, for precise focusings here. For instance, uh, the lens of the eye that is white is to the right, and the curved line to the left is the retina. If light rays come in like the blue lines, they focus behind the retina. When it crosses the retina, it's, it's, it's not focused, and you get a fuzzy picture there. Or as illustrated by the yellow lines that focus in front of the retina. In order to get a sharp image, uh, you have to have patterns of, of light rays like the red lines, and they focus right on the retina. There you get a, there you get a sharp image. So focusing is a very important feature uh, of these eyes if they're going to work and provide you a clear picture. Uh, then there's the compound eye. The uh, compound eye is called that because it has so many different parts. And you can see, for instance, uh, in this picture, kind of a sphere at the left. You've got uh, one unit that's showed with that uh, blue lens on top of it. And you have many of these. and. Uh, uh, Insects uh, often have this kind of an eye, which is entirely different than uh, the normal eye that we showed you in the last picture. Uh, in fact, a dragonfly will have 28,000 of these units, these little vertical units we show you there, uh, each one pointing in a slightly different direction. And you have to have an exact focus, otherwise the difference in direction will not be detected by the eye. Uh, so again, there again, you need uh, precise optics. Does this get a, a camera-like image? Do they make a, yes. an image out of that? Yeah, they make an image. They, the information from each of those tubes is, goes, to a brain. goes to the brain. They put the picture together. Now, evolutionists have suggested that, uh, well, uh, maybe all these eyes could have evolved from one common ancestor. Okay. And one of the arguments that they have used is very sophisticated, and uh, uh, actually the research is quite admirable. It's done with uh, genetic engineering, and what they did was they took a master gene out of a mouse, they put it in a fly, and they got fly larva, and they got that fly to produce an eye on its leg. Was it a functional eye? Well, to, to the extent that it would produce a, a voltage change, yes, uh, the eye seemed to be functional. And you have here a picture of this eye here. It's uh, the whitish part there on the leg to the right uh, of the uh, fruit fly. 
and that uh, I was produced by a gene from a mouse. And so the implication is, hey, uh, somewhere back here, you know, these all have a common ancestor. But I'd point out that this, this is uh, an argument that you can use both ways. It would seem like you could, it, it's as much a evidence of degeneration as it is one of formation. Well, yeah, there's that, yes, very, very definitely. But uh, uh, they're trying to say, well, no, there's a common ancestor to all this. But uh, one could say, well, okay, that common ancestor represents evolutionary relationship. But one can also say, just as easily, that represents a common designer. Design. Uh, one god did all this. It's a, almost an argument for monotheism in a way. <laughs> uh, so we, we have these, uh, these suggestions, but uh, the thing that you need to keep in mind here is that because they found two similar genes here, they suggested, well, relationship. But it takes thousands of other genes to make this kind of eye. And they're different for the compound eye than they are for the normal eye that we were referring to earlier. So uh, there's, there's a lot of information you need to add to this picture if you can get an eye like this, not just one common master gene. And uh, God might have well created master genes for the development of many animals, and we find similarities. And this is. They're finding more and more of these cases where there are similarities in, in these master genes here. Well, we want to uh, look at various eyes here and uh, discuss some of the problems that the eye poses. And one of the things that we want to note is that the various eyes we find in the animal kingdom do not fit an evolutionary sequence. And this is remarkable, actually. Uh, for instance, very closely to an animals may have very different kinds of eyes. Uh, evolutionarily similar animals yes. have very different eyes. Yes. Oh. An example here is, uh, for instance, the octopus. We're all probably familiar with the octopus. You see the eye there that is pointed out and so on. The eye of an octopus is, is somewhat like what we, our normal eye. It uh, uh, has a lens and a retina and so on and uh, a cornea in the front and so on. It's uh, uh, not all that different from our eyes. Uh, and the, the, uh, the octopus uh, is very closely related to the chambered nautilus. Now, uh, it's the same phylum, phylum mollusca, same class, class cephalopoda, and so on. And uh, the uh, octopus has arms, and you, you notice here uh, where the eyes point, in fact, pointing out uh, to the left of the shell there, you can see uh, like the uh, tentacles sticking out there, which are, uh, the animals are very closely related. Now, chambered nautilus has a shell, octopus does not have a shell. But when you come to its eye, it's entirely different. The eye of the chambered nautilus is simply an empty bag. And this is a picture here. And you, you see that this is all there is to it. So it, it's, it's got a little hole to the outside seawater, so it's just a bag of, a bag of seawater with some uh, nerve elements in the back of it. Yeah, you got, you got four million light-sensitive cells there in that nerve element back there in the, in the retina part, so it's, it's, uh, it's fairly comprehensive. But it's no lens, no cornea, it's, it's a pinhole camera type of thing. Light coming in from a spot will hit a spot on the retina so the animal puts a picture together by the light going through this, this little pinhole, and that, that whole eye just full of seawater. It's a very different eye. Well, uh, very different animals may have the similar eyes. Uh, for instance, uh, look at this a giraffe. Now, the eye of a giraffe, oh, which you can see, uh, has two of them up there, <laughs> uh, is uh, very similar to ours. It's what we call uh, this normal uh, eye. And uh, here is a picture of it with a lens and a cornea in front and the retina behind. Uh, and this is the way the giraffe sees it. Now, the giraffe is in one major category of animals. Evolutionists divide the animal kingdom into two major categories. Uh, one would be the echinoderms and vertebrates like us. And so the other one 
would be mollusks, uh, squids, uh, octopus, so on, belong in that in that category. Uh, worms, earthworms, uh, uh, insects belong in the other category. Most most all animals belong in this so-called other category. But when we look at the eyes of the squid, for instance, and uh, this is this is a squid. Most of these are about three feet long. You know, we got these giant squids live in the deep ocean, and the uh, largest invertebrates we have. Some of them uh, stretching out their, their tentacles and feelers and so on, uh, reaching this 50, 60 foot length. And they've got the biggest eyes that we know of. One eye of a squid that washed up on the shores of New Zealand had a diameter of 16 inches. 16 inches. <laughs> and it's estimated it had a billion light-sensitive cells in it. And it's that that eye like we have. It's that eye like we have, but it's in the On this other very primitive type type of animal it's, it's, type. It's, it's the other half of the of the, of the uh, animal kingdom that okay. it's supposed to. The, these two halves supposed to evolve a long time ago uh, when they were much simpler type of organisms, uh, a type of thing. And this is this is the kind of eye that that squid has here. Uh, you, lens, pupil, cornea, just, just like we have more or less in the retina and on the back and so on. So two very different kinds of animals, very similar eyes, uh, very similar parts. This diagram tells you a little bit about uh, the parts that are similar, uh, labeled there in the uh, middle of it, eyelids, iris, pupil, lens, cornea, ciliar muscles. Uh, how could evolution produce two eyes, things so similar, when these are in two entirely different independent groups? It is a question that is posed. Uh, evolution say, well, it just happened to happen that way. But so this would imply <clears throat> that uh, from a statistical standpoint, uh, these are extremely rare events but this is supposing that that rare event happened twice. And you have to have it thousands of times. I mean, there are many genes involved in these eyes. Uh, it, uh, they're, they're, geologic time, there's no time whatsoever for this. When you, when you calculate it out, it just does not work. Uh, it it's borders very much on the impossible uh, type of thing. Uh, but evolutionists, uh, call this parallel evolution. They also have the term uh, convergent evolution, mm -hmm. uh, which they use, uh, uh, use far too often because uh, this situation occurs in many different types of uh, comparisons in the animal kingdom. We have uh, another difference again where we have some simple animals that have complex eyes and some complex animals that have simple eyes. And uh, let me give you another example here. Uh, this is, on the left, you have the, the uh, front end of a worm, and you can see uh, uh, two eyes there in front, uh, blue lenses uh, indicated there. This is a marine worm. It was all over the world in the ocean. Uh, it's a teeny little thing, uh, about a millimeter wide and about five, seven millimeters long. Uh, different species vary a little bit in size. Uh, to the right is is a detail to that eye, and it is again very much similar like our normal eye, a camera eye. You can see it's, it's got a cornea in front, it's got a lens, uh, and it's got a retina behind, uh, and so on, uh, optic fibers, nerves, and so on. <laughs> How far down in the geologic column does this complicated eye pop up? Well. It, Quite a ways down, uh, they found the rel relatives to this uh, type of thing. Yeah. Uh, but it, uh, you know, it's uh, this teeny little worm here with this very advanced type of eye that uh, and they suspect it, it can focus. Uh, they, they know that the worm is not just looking at light because uh, each of these eyes has three muscles that moves the eye around different directions. They're looking at stuff when they're uh, using their eyes type of thing. So it, it's, it's a, a, a real workable uh, uh, image producing uh, kind of eye. Then, then you 
get to our phylum, uh, the most advanced phylum, mm -hmm. the chordates. Uh, and there, there you find a, an organism that doesn't have any eyes at all. So, uh, you see, we've got a, a simple worm with a complex eye. We've got an advanced chordate, and uh, this is called the lancet uh, amphioxus, uh, and it's uh, considered a very important intermediate uh, in the evolution of chordates. It, uh, it has a stiffening rod in the back. It has a, its nerve tube is in the back, uh, not in the front as it would be or at the bottom like it would be for, for a worm type of thing. And uh, it's sensitive to light, but it doesn't have an eye. In its nerve tube, it has some light-sensitive uh, cells, and uh, that's, you can tell it's light or dark, but you certainly cannot form an image type of thing. So uh, all kinds of different eyes out there, but they don't seem to fit uh, a pattern of evolutionary advancement that we would expect. Let me just sh uh, show you another kind of eye here. And uh, this, one, this one will uh, really challenge your imagination. Uh, this is a, a little copepod-like organism. This organism is only about one millimeter wide. There are two lenses in front, as indicated by the rent arrow. And there are two scanning lenses further back, indicated by the green arrow. These scanning lenses vibrate back and forth, analyzing the picture produced by the front lenses. There is no evolutionary survival value for the scanning lenses until you have the front lenses and vice versa. And you also need a light sensitive retina and muscles to vibrate the back lenses. Here we have an example of reducible complexity. There are all kinds of different eyes out there. We just mentioned four main ones and I'll briefly review these. Uh, uh, how could one evolve from the other because they're so different from each other? Uh, we, we looked at the compound eye of the insect. We looked at the pinhole eye of the um, uh, chambered nautilus. We looked at the normal eye of the, of the vertebrates uh, and the squid. <laughs> Happened to get involved in this. Uh, or, and we looked at the scanning eye of this Copalia uh, uh, organism. And uh, how could these evolve from, from uh, one to the other? Well, uh, evolutionists have addressed this, and what they've said is that, uh, well, uh, you can't do it, you can't evolve. The eyes must have evolved independently. And these are very complex organisms, and uh, evolution mutations cannot plan ahead. They cannot plan ahead for uh, some kind of complex organism. Every step has to provide survival value. You have independent parts that don't work. So you don't really have a, uh, a mechanism here for producing advanced kind of, of uh, organisms here. They're so very different. They don't follow an average pattern. Uh, and it's very difficult to evolve just one kind of eye, let alone all these various kinds. So uh, the eye, you know, it very much looks like uh, God created the eye. Well, it's fascinating to to have. If I if I understand what you've told us here, <clears throat> instead of uh, a, a simple organism with a simple eye evolving more complexity and more complexity, <laughs> uh, to where we have a complex animal with a complex eye. We have simple animals with extremely complex eyes and simple eyes. We have other complex animals with simple eyes and maybe no just eyes. light forming, <laughs> light, light sensing uh, ability, and then very complex things. So it makes it very hard to conceptually think of that as an evolutionary process from simple to complex. Different kinds of uh, systems of eyes in which 
some have lenses, some have pinholes, some have little scanning jobs back there, all to accomplish the same purpose. It seems like there was a bunch of intelligence putting a lot of this together to make it come out that way. Well, we're not through with the eye. There's another, another lecture that is going to be on, on more about the eye because it's more complex. And we want to get to that at the next time we get together. And so be sure and hang around. Be with us then. And we'll see you at the next lecture when we have more about Darwin's eyes. If you would like additional free information about these discussions, there is a PowerPoint resource available on the internet that covers many more details than could be provided in this lecture series. The resource is titled, The Bible and Science, and is available at scienceandscriptures.com. Be sure to add an S at the end of the word scriptures to get to the right web page. The Bible and Science resource follows the same sequence of topics as the Where is Truth series, but it is divided into 17 separate discussions instead of the 14 videos of the Where is Truth series. The title of the discussions, an introductory outline, and an index will lead you to the topics you want. The Bible and Science discussions served as the resource for the Where is Truth videos. To facilitate understanding and learning, each of the 17 PowerPoint discussions in the Bible and Science resource is provided with a set of questions and their answers. You will find these at the end of each PowerPoint presentation. The Bible and Science resource was designed especially for students and teachers. However, it can be of great help to anybody interested in the topics.